morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our friends who have joined here for today's webinar, which is Career Insights for the Post-COVID World, hosted by CFA Institute and CFA Society India. I would like to take a moment to welcome all our audience from around the world who is joining us remotely today. My name is Bihari Lal Devra. I am a director with the Backless Asset Manager, which is a Category 3 uh, Alternative Investment Fund. And in my volunteer capacity, uh, I serve as a volunteer, as a member of board on CFA Society India, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few housekeeping notes. Today's webinar is scheduled for around 60 minutes, including the Q&A. We expect about 45 minutes or so on the speaker presentation and 15, 20 minutes for the questions and answers towards the end. We'll be leaving enough time for Q&A, so please feel free to post your questions throughout the presentations under the Q&A tab, which is at the bottom of your screen. The webinar presentation will be available to view after the presentation concludes in the chat box via link. You can download the same. We value your feedback, so please complete your evaluation survey before you uh, sign off today. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, uh, Ms. Josna Krishnan. I don't know if I pronounced it right. Let me pronounce it once more. Josna Krishnan. She is a managing partner at Elevere Equity. She joined Elevere in 2011 and leads the investment, investing team in India. She has more than 15 years of experience in retail financial services, business operations, analytics, and investing in early stage ventures. Uh, apart from being on almost like a dozen boards, she, uh, she specializes uh, on impact investing across arena, uh, you know, starting with affordable school startups to, you know, uh, loan intermediations to, you know, enabling credit and so on and so forth. Uh, prior to LFS, she worked at HSBC across multiple roles, including retail banking, sales operation, human resources to be more precise, uh, strategy, finance, and business intelligence. Uh, she is a CFA charter holder and uh, welcome Josna and over to you. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, thanks, everyone. And I think uh, all of you all have joined this evening to get some insights into some post-COVID career strategies. Uh, this may feel like a slightly different uh, session because I'm going to delve into a couple of themes. But before that, uh, a quick introduction to both myself and the context of, of the conversation lies in, in Elevar Equity. And if I can just give you a very quick background. Um, Elevar Equity, we've been investing for the last 15 years across uh, emerging markets, to be more precise, India and Latin America. And the focus has really been to deliver essential services. And, and we've done that through limited investments in about 39 odd companies. Um, to over 30 million underserved customers. Now, while that statement sounds what it is, if I have to simplify uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, effectively what we end up doing is to look at businesses which are probably non-existent because we are very early stage investors. We probably are the first institutional investment into businesses. And we almost need to imagine the world 10 years out to be able to make an investment decision. And all of that conviction comes from the understanding of the end market and the business models and entrepreneurs we're looking to back. So uh, I joined Elevar in 2011, and it was an interesting journey for me because growing up, I had traveled into smaller towns and cities all over India. And I saw immense potential in, in a certain entrepreneurial resilience that lies in low-income communities. And I was very fascinated. Uh, post MBA, like most people, I, I joined HSBC as a management trainee and I spent uh, seven, eight years across multiple roles in retail banking. Uh, but somewhere in 2011, I was, uh, when I thought about what next, I was really keen to go back to that uh, resilience that I saw in low income communities. And when I started looking around, I realized that I wanted to marry the commercial experience I had in the context of retail businesses with something that I was passionate about, which is low-income communities. Now, 2011 was a really tough year. Uh, the industry, uh, for example, microfinance was coming out of crisis. And uh, I was very keen to move into a space which was close to microfinance back then because impact investing was not a very popular phase. 
um so as i took that call uh, as i look back i think there's been a fascinating journey and i hope through today i'll i'll walk you through some insights which are quite relevant in the post covid world as we call it today um so if i if i have to think about the last 7 8 years lots of people have asked me saying what's a good way to transition into an impact career and uh, there's no easy answer there because uh, a it is important to even try and understand what impact and the role of the finance and impact is and b uh, there is an element of making some entrepreneurial calls within your career if you have to move into a space which is less defined and early in its trends but there is conviction behind those calls and so i'm going to cover these across two themes one is the role of finance and entrepreneurial spirit when it comes to impact invest uh, impact and finance and the second of course is the same thing applied to your careers so let's let's probably kick off um, like i said when i moved out of hspc most people most of my colleagues thought that i was moving into the non profit space uh but it's interesting uh, if you look at what's on your screen there is an entire range which defines what the impact investment landscape could look like um on the right hand side you see what is traditional philanthropy this is where uh, there is grant money where you make investments or you give money without expectations of the money coming back but with clear expectation of what the outcome of that money which is deployed could be and if you move to the extreme left that's the other end of the spectrum where returns on investments is the only objective right you see an interesting word on top which is intention and as we go into all the circles in the middle i think it is this term intention which helps differentiate between the different nuances within the overall impact investment landscape um there are a whole range of terms that you all may have heard of esg which is environmental and social governance all of these concepts are quite popular today uh there are internationally several organization which make uh, pri or program related investments there are a range of hybrid in instruments some really fascinating ones which combine financial returns with certain impact milestones and those have been popularized in certain sectors um and so in all of this there is apart from intention there is a question of what is the return expectation because ultimately when you deploy finance as a resource you are looking for a certain set of returns and the question is what is the kind of return you're looking for and what is the trade off if i may call it so that you're willing to make for the sake of uh, impact um let's maybe move on to um while i think it's almost impossible to cover all the details on the impact space what i have found personally useful is and, I've, and I've, as i have spoken to a lot of candidates who tried to make these shifts it's important to try and understand uh, the organizations that exist in the impact space and a good framework is the set of questions that i have put up here um i think start off with trying to understand what is the intentionality and the priorities of a certain firm uh very often there are firms that talk about impact first or finance first kind of terms uh which help identify as to what's the primary objective right um just understanding that helps you understand whether the entity is completely commercial is it uh, partly guided by um a, a a primary set of objectives which uh, override the commercial priorities etc and it's important because that goes into how the organization is constructed it's it goes into how the work is structured and how the investments are structured um the second is how the entity is funded um the impact space like i said comes in many different shapes and forms there are a lot of uh, philanthropists that have set up permanent capital vehicles which are fundamentally dedicated to the impact space uh, these are balance sheets that don't come with a time horizon but have very clearly stated impact objectives um, and have a great set of professionals working for them trying to achieve those objectives on the other hand you have absolutely regular commercial funds like elvar is one such example which are funded by 
um, investors who are seeking uh, regular commercial returns and at the same time are backing an investment thesis that is centered around impact. Um, I think it's important to understand this partly because, again, this impacts the DNA of the organization and the kind of roles one, that one ends up playing in these organizations. The third is decision making and leadership. Um, here again, uh, depending on the kind, and, and this, while I'm talking about the impact space, probably holds for any organization you look to uh, join or evaluate joining, et cetera. There is an element of understanding the org design and understanding where decision making takes place and what is the authority um, for people who are closer to the ground, because that determines how nimble a team is on the ground. I think the fourth question is a really important question. And as we go into more about uh, details on your passion and how it aligns, uh, it's important to understand what is the organization's theory of change or what is the thesis? Is the objective to change the world from a financial inclusion standpoint? Is the objective to help with climate change? Is the objective to introduce uh, green technology? Is the objective to, to back cutting edge technology in healthcare or improve education? All of these are important aspects to understand because there is a view that each of these organizations are founded around. Um, then I would say track record, which also ties into the concept of clarity and consistency. It would be good to understand whether how long these organizations have been around and how long uh, they have been following the, the stated theory of change or thesis and the consistency and clarity with which they have done this. Uh, one thing we've experienced is there is a lot of evolution in thought as far as impact theories are concerned and lots of firms are actually in the midst of debating and firming up what their strategies are and this is a fairly dynamic process. Um, ultimately, I would say apart from just investing firms, there are several adjacencies within the impact space which range from consulting firms to operating firms, research firms, firms that measure and audit impact numbers, uh, there are recruitment firms these days that are specializing on impact uh, recruitments. Uh, media, often you would have seen people focusing on certain themes. And, and like I said, while impact is often associated with a not-for-profit or philanthropy um, in terms of biases, the reality is uh, the impact space is a massive space and it has been growing in terms of trends and in terms of the voices you hear globally. Um, in this context, uh, what I thought would be useful today is to not try and list out the hundreds of types of impact organizations that may exist uh, across the board, but to try and take an example of something that we can deep dive into just for the next five, seven minutes and understand a bit more in detail so that uh, it gives you a flavor of what it means to understand an organization or a certain impact thesis. And once you do that, I think you should be able to ask similar questions, maybe use a reference point and understand what the different dimensions are as you explore the rest of the space, right? Um, if, if you remember the earlier slide that I showed, there was one middle circle which had a red circle and I'm gonna just take a few minutes to, to dive deeper into that aspect. It's probably one of those which, when I joined Elevar, one of my biggest questions was, is there a trade-off between the commercial objective of capital and the integrity with which you serve the end customer, which in, in this case is the underserved customer? Um, I think that that question uh, was an important question for me. And what I realized was that if the DNA of the business is focused on, on a certain customer type, it is possible to construct great business models around it, which do not conflict or trade off between impact and commercial returns. Now it's not true of everything in that entire spectrum, but it is true of a certain niche that I'm talking about. Um, and all of you all are probably familiar with the microfinance story. Uh, back in 2000, this was primarily a not-for-profit concept uh, with very few microfinance borrowers in the market and most customers borrowing off informal money lenders. Um, and I think all of us are familiar with what the pros and cons of the informal systems are. Uh, when microfinance uh, started converting into for-profit structures, and we were involved with a few of them early in the days, starting 2004, 
uh, we saw rapid growth and penetration. And as the commercial principles were applied towards scale, raising capital, and bringing in a certain professional manner to growing these institutions, there was, you, you can see the results for yourself, right? Today, microfinance is a mainstream investment sector. There is private equity, there is public market interest, and, and the sector has grown in a phenomenal manner. Right from the days when big four audit firms would not be willing to audit these companies because they were unfamiliar with the business models to not having a rating agency that understood what they were, Today, there are, there are uh, firms that are um, absolutely integral to these journeys and, and have played a critical role. Um, what this shows is that there is a massive consumer segment there and there is a massive customer segment that has been completely untapped, primarily because there's a certain perception of risk and that has primarily existed because uh, most commercial players have not understood or, or spent time on the ground to understand the customer base. Uh, moving on, I mean, this whole concept has uh, um, replicated itself and we've seen several sectors. Today, MSME or small businesses is a big theme. Education, and you all would have read headlines about edtech players and education companies getting funded. There is financial inclusion as a theme which continues to remain relevant. Agriculture and ag tech is popular healthcare, affordable housing, payments, there are several business models in the context of underserved markets that hold tremendous potential. What it does require is, is a certain amount of understanding of the market and a team that knows how to uh, back, uh, build businesses in these journeys. Um, I'm often asked saying that uh, is every business uh, an impact business and what's the difference between, you know, an impact business and a regular business that, uh, well, even, even if there are businesses that set up, uh, end up employing a lot of people, ultimately it feels like impact. And I think there is a, there is a simple answer to that question and how we look at the world, which is that um, ultimately, like I said, the word intentionality is important. The question is, is the business built in order to serve the end customer or is the impact on the, the underserved community a byproduct of the business? Uh, for me, an impact business is defined in this particular niche by a business model that is consciously and deliberately building their DNA around the low income communities, around the underserved markets. And that differentiates what a core impact business is because when the scaling journey and several other decisions get complicated, there isn't a conflict, there isn't a risk of moving away from the interest of this customer. And the aim to create a high, uh, highly attractive business, even from a commercial sense, is focused on delivering better to this customer segment. Um, so I'm going to attempt a quick version of, of a theory which, is, which makes this relevant from a financial analysis standpoint, uh, which is what does it take to align impact and capital markets, right? So the first point, like I mentioned, is really the customer. Here, if you look at this X, Y axis, you will see that there is the upper end talks about high wallet share. The lower end is a low wallet share customer. If you just think about your own self, if you're making a purchase, which is a high wallet share purchase, it is likely that you will be very demanding of anything, right? For example, if you buy a property, you want to make sure that you're getting value for money and you want to make sure that is a well thought out decision. Um, on the other axis, you see a low ARPU, which stands for average revenue per user and a high average revenue per user uh, customer. Now, when you think about low ARPU, there are examples like in telecom, which is a low ARPU, but when you think about the top left-hand side quadrant, uh, which is a combination of low ARPU and high wallet share, you're actually talking about a customer for whom what you're delivering may be low ticket size in the general context of how businesses are built, but it represents a very high wallet share or is a meaningful part of the customer's life. What it means is that you're dealing with a customer for whom a small ticket item is extremely important and the customer is going to demand value for money. The moment you go into that space, uh, the DNA of the organization has to be constructed around solving for the customer. 
Now, I must say over the last several years, this customer segment has proved to be extremely fascinating. And uh, for those who are not familiar, it is counterintuitive. This is a segment that uh, is actually sensitive to pricing, but has a willingness to pay for quality because the reality is they already spend on several essential services, but they don't get the quality or the pricing that uh, even you and I get simply because there is an issue of access. Uh, very often these customers who could be in the form of smallholder farmers, small business owners, uh, people who earn smaller amounts as far as salaries are concerned, very often part of informal uh, livelihoods in our economy. They actually have a strong sense of business acumen and a strong driver of how they take their decisions. Uh, for someone who doesn't understand the segment, it may feel random, they may not speak good, I mean, they may not be fluent as far as language skills or technology skills are concerned, but in the context of their lives, they're very, very focused and, and take sharp decisions as far as uh, choices are concerned. And it, with multiple crises that we've gone through, we've seen high intentionality, a big part of our portfolio has been a lending portfolio over the last decade or so, and we've seen how this customer segment responds to a certain business that is offered to them, loans that are offered to them. And so long as the company understands how to underwrite the segment uh, by spending time on the ground, we've seen great quality growth and, and great quality customers uh, partnering with these businesses. Uh, so very often the market perception is one of high risk, but uh, the more you spend time on the ground, the lesser risk you perceive. Uh, in fact, very early on in my journey, I had spoken to somebody who had moved from a multinational bank to one of our small business lenders and uh, as the head of risk. And, and he said he was willing to bet his money on this customer segment any day because he wasn't underwriting loans based on audited balance sheets, but he was looking at real cash flows, right? Um, it is also fascinating to see that the, there is a lot of inbuilt community level resilience in this customer segment. And uh, there, are, there are some pretty well laid out practices. Uh, for example, when you, when you look at the whole uh, power loom sector in Tamil Nadu and some of the states, uh, there are several weavers, but there is a method in which they're constructed. There is a master weaver who maintains books of accounts on what advances are paid to different people. None of it is recognized by the formal banking system. But if you were to actually go and sit down, it is actually fairly uh real to have good visibility into cash flows and productivity and and how these segments work so ultimately it requires deep domain ex expertise to understand the customer segment and i think it also requires all of us to set aside preconceived notions and judgments on on how communities operate and to spend time on the ground um, moving to uh, what kind of business models work uh, in these segments what we found very effective is, uh, this slide may, may feel like a little busy. Uh, I don't know how many of you all have spent time and, and, at, and understood what business flywheels are like. If you've not, feel free to spend some time, post this session and Google the concept. It is an interesting concept that uh, drives momentum for businesses. Uh, but in, in low income communities, very often we've seen that there is a twin flywheel effect. If your core proposition, and if you look at the left, the right hand side flywheel, which is the customer flywheel, helps solve for the low income, low ARPU, high wallet share customer. It actually leads to both resilience and household prosperity. Uh, most of these customers operate in the context of families which have multiple sources of income. And that in turn leads to a lot of growth, referrals, and loyalty. And the reason I say loyalty is because there is a sense of um, very often these businesses that uh, offer formal solutions to the segment are the first brands in their life. And there is a sense of uh, loyalty with the, such solution oriented brands in their lives. What that means is when you talk about some of the largest consumer bases globally, which are concentrated in emerging markets, it means there is massive business potential and which in turn leads to a certain business flywheel effect starting with the solutions the business is offering leading to mass loyalty, leading to higher lifetime value of the customer and minimized cost of acquisition. Um, and a lot of transaction velocity, which actually drives the ROE and long-term profitability of the business. Um, 
for those of you all, I think all of you all have looked at uh, ROE breakdowns through dew point models, etc. Uh, what we've found over the last 15 years uh, is that just applying an additional metric to this breakdown um, to the ROE drivers is a fascinating way to see how the alignment of impact and commercial interests in terms of return of capital takes place. So all of you all are probably familiar with the net income by revenue, which is the profit margin multiplied by uh, a certain equity turnover, which, which could be one breakdown of equity. And while there are other breakdowns, in this case, what we follow is a principle, what we've seen work well even in, in, in businesses like microfinance, is a principle where if you were to look at introducing the concept of customer business value, uh, which is really the value you deliver to the end customer. So for example, if you're selling something like insurance, it's not about the premium, which is really the revenue in the books of the company, but it's about the value to the end customer. When you think about that concept of what is the value you're delivering to the customer, it leads you to two new ratios. One is customer margin, uh, which is the price you pay for this value that is being delivered, the price paid by the customer. And the second is um, a CBV to equity, which is an impact leverage. Now, these two ratios uh, both work in the right direction uh, from both uh, an ROE standpoint and from an impact standpoint, if you just look to maximize customer business value. And this is an interesting concept you can read up more about uh, online, but I just thought I'd introduce this more to share that impact and commercial investing are not too mutually exclusive concepts, right? They are very interlinked and it's possible to have the two go hand in hand. Um, very quickly, um, if I was to think about, so, so one is I think, now I just gave you an example of how impact and mainstream uh, capital can come together. But if you were to think about how to expand that and, and analyze the rest of the impact space, uh, I think you should do that and make sure you understand that well. Because uh, one of the things I've found common is that most of the people who would like to join the impact space uh, struggle to form a rationale as to why. Very often it comes from a need to do some good, but at the same time, there are extremely bright people and talent that we've seen move over to the impact space. And um, I think in the next part of this session, for the next 10, 15 minutes, I'd like to focus on a certain driver of what it takes to build a career in impact. Um, I think how to find a job in impact is a little bit more tactical than, and while there are a few points that could uh, point you in the right direction, it's more important to understand what a career in impact means. Um, there is, if, if you look at, um, if you look at the term entrepreneurs, now this is a whole range of pictures of entrepreneurs way back historically, right? And yes, they're all entrepreneurs and they're the way we understand the term entrepreneurs the best. They, they very often are coming from a diverse set of backgrounds. They're taking uh, breaks from careers which may have been fairly rewarding. They're taking a chance, they're taking a risk. Uh, they're setting out to establish a new business model, very often raise money from private equity or venture capital, and uh, very often also make headlines, right? Uh, so that is one, one aspect of being an entrepreneur. And, and over the years, we've backed a lot of entrepreneurs who have taken those calls. And for us, it's important that they have conviction in what they are backing themselves on and what is it that they are looking to build. Uh, but if you look at, for example, this is the set of LMR partners. And I think this also comes out of an entrepreneurial journey as a fund. Uh, and there are many types of funds. Some have more institutional backing, some are entrepreneurial and we're definitely an entrepreneurial fund. Everybody moved out of uh, regular commercial careers. Um, we come from a variety of backgrounds, right? Legal, one was an economist. I come from a retail banking background. My colleague Vipul has spent time both in his family business as well as spent time in the back uh, with investment banking, et cetera. But if you look at what makes for an entrepreneurial career, it is actually uh, not so much about resumes because if you look at any of our resumes, I'm not sure you will find too much commonality or an ability to predict what it takes uh, to form uh, an entrepreneurial career in an emerging space like impact investing, right? Um, if you, for me, what was fascinating was uh, this gentleman, Umesh, and just a week ago, we had done a virtual 
visit to a new branch opening in Akole in Maharashtra, which is a small town. Um, and Umesh had actually spent about five years uh, working with a bank and decided to move back closer home with an NBFC with barely any track record, right? And, and I was curious as to how he took that call. And he was very clear saying that I wanted to move to a location which I understood better, which was closer to his hometown because he had migrated to a, a main city to join the bank. And he also wanted to ensure that he had more responsibilities and liked the fact that he could distribute a broader set of products with more uh, decision-making authority. So to me, I was really fascinated and uh, felt this was a great example of an entrepreneurial call in a career. And this happened post-COVID, uh, which I thought was very impressive in a world where people are worried and are trying to secure jobs in more predictable organizations. Um, similarly, there are umpteen number of cases we've seen in this customer segment I was talking about. Uh, this particular uh, couple you mentioned actually used to aggregate scrap from sub-dealers lots of impact due to the lockdown, ended up uh, moving to something which was an emerging theme in, in rural markets, which was the transportation of fruits and vegetables from wholesale to catchment villages. Uh, agriculture did get a lot of focus during this phase. Similarly, the lady here mentioned uh, used to make papad. And, and what is interesting and fascinating for me is that apart from repositioning the product she went on to actually move from a wholesale to a retail business to expand her margins, right? Now, this is the, the entrepreneurial resilience and spirit I was talking about. And like this, there are hundreds and thousands and millions of cases as far as customer segments are concerned. The reason I mention this is that um, in all the work that we do as far as early stage investing and working uh, in the space of impact is concerned, we are always looking for talent whether it is uh, at a portfolio company level or in the broader space, which uh, is entrepreneurial in nature because the good part is this is a nascent space, which means a lot of the principles of how things function are still in the works of being designed, right? So I'm going to actually take a few minutes to talk about what's common. I mean, we, we given uh, what, uh, what was shared, I do sit on a lot of boards. We do talk to a lot of people who make career shifts into the kind of impact-oriented organizations we back. And uh, so we are recruiting senior management profiles, CXO profiles. We meet like over 500 uh, plus entrepreneurs and end up backing one or two of them. But also a lot of people we meet in order to recruit for LFR. Ultimately, while the positions are few, there are lots of conversations. And here's really what we screen for, right? Uh, we are looking for a clear view of why the move. And the reason I say this is important is there's a difference between joining an organization which is set in its ways or a space or an industry which is completely set in its ways versus joining some, some organization which is still growing and in the early stages of a cycle which is set out to boom, right? And, and the reason I mention this is because the space of impact is in its early years. And there is a lot of potential for um, a lot of things that are yet to be defined. So we are always looking for people who would not just accept things for what they are, but would come with a certain view of their own. Um, I do want to clarify that uh, in everything we look for, we are looking for excellent track record from their past roles, right? So we are looking for demonstrated execution track record. We are looking for technical skills. Um, and, and I can say this for organizations that are definitely in the space we operate in, which are commercial in nature, there is no trade-off on skill sets or track record or ambition or aspiration. Um, in fact, we look for people who actually are comfortable uh, moving, uh, uh, speaking one's mind. They're not necessarily about perfection, but they're aware of their own journey and, and staying informed and connected through their conversations. Um, another fascinating feature that I found was the sense of attention to details and thoughtfulness. In fact, some of the best CEOs I've interacted with and founders I've interacted with are extremely thoughtful in terms of how they deal with you, including thinking through logistics and things like that. Uh, needless to say, there is the clarity of thinking, communication, and the most important factor that I would say is pulse of the customer segment or the end market that you're looking to work with. 
which is very very critical so if if any of you all would like to explore a career in impact it's important that you think about what is it that you want to join what kind of organization and what do you know about that organization um i'm going to skim through a little bit on uh, what how does one really look for roles in this space um and when you think about this i think the first step is to really uh, figure out uh, which kind of institutions exist in the space right now there are a lot of apex bodies or or membership bodies uh, like the gin which is a global impact investors uh, network there is gsg there is iic in india etc i think it's easy to start in some of these places figure out what are the institutions that exist in the market um, a good idea is to actually look up these organizations online and understand how the teams are constructed very often you may find that the number of roles are limited uh, but also they are fairly non standardized so i would not i think this is one of those spaces that requires you to do a fairly thorough research to understand i mean you shouldn't judge the space based on a few organizations you may realize there's a 10 member team you may realize there's a 200 member team and you may realize there are uh, operating companies with thousands of employees and there may be roles that are fascinating there right so uh, the role designations range from what you hear typically in investing firms uh, could be analyst associate sometimes there are investment managers principals directors all very misleading if you ask me i think uh, ultimately what matters is what is the work you do what's the designation and of course i think as as most of you all would be interested what is the compensation and what are the career options there on right so i would recommend look up teams look up uh, how they are constructed and and understand better i will also say this is still one of those spaces where references and networks work really well um and so if you do know people who can connect you to folks who work with organizations or or have a better understanding of the space use that to get a better insight as against just looking up details online um look at uh, you could also i think like i said earlier i think the one one aspect is to look at jobs i think the other aspect is look at uh, careers and i think careers can start in many different ways right there are lots of companies there are incubators and seed investors uh, that do earlier stage work um and so if you're really keen i think i would recommend don't just stick to the higher profile fancier sounding institutions which are established because the chances are you will end up with very few number of openings there if you're keen figure out something that takes you closer to this world um the interesting part is there aren't stereotypes with respect to prior backgrounds you don't need to be an ex mckinsey consultant or a or a big four person with a solid investment banking track record to make this move i think it is about uh, figuring out how you marry your professional experience with your passion um and having said that i will continue to say that when it comes to hardcore investing roles the bar does tend to be really really high right so that is the reality so in all i think it, this space has all the pros and cons of of starting very early uh in a certain wave or a trend that you see globally and and seeing how you make the most of it um i think the last 5 uh, 10 minutes maybe that i spend before we jump on to q and a maybe is uh one is i've, I've I've often seen folks think about career decisions and had conversations with them and realized that you know there are some principles which are very similar to how you think about building an investment portfolio and I'm sure all of you all uh, there are fascinating subjects within the CFA program that talk through portfolio construction etc and uh, if you actually marry that uh, you will find that uh, there are similarities for instance i think you need to start by understanding your own risk appetite right uh, this is the 101 of investing i think it's the 101 of how you build your career you need to be clear as to what are your trade offs what is it that you're willing what is the kind of risk you're willing to take in your own career uh, there is a risk reward ratio that pays off well in the long run and uh, ultimately you need to figure out what your appetite is there are people who tend to take calls and then realize that uh, they are too nervous about those calls so i think it's important you build your conviction you figure out what your drivers are in life and and take decisions around your own risk based on that the second point is mapping out skills now 
One is a lot of people do ask what are your strengths, what are your skills, and I think there are a whole host of skills that could be useful in the context of careers and impact. Uh, but I would say the bigger factor that I would recommend you think about is what is it that you really, really enjoy doing? Because in my experience, if, if, if you need to excel in your career, you've got to enjoy what you're good at. It's not one of the two. You've got to be really good at what you do and you've got to really enjoy what you do. And only when these two come together, the probability of success really shoots through the roof, right? And so that is a very important principle to my mind. Very similar, I think, to, to how you may want to look at investing also, because ultimately, if you don't enjoy it, you're less likely to make the right decisions. Um, the third thing, again, I think there is a fair amount of uh, popularization of sectors and roles. And, you know, even, even the whole B-school frenzy of certain types of roles are are uh, quite stereotyped at some level, but I've found that uh, people who've done much better in their careers are those who spent equal or more time underwriting teams and organizations. Like they say, you know, you join an organization because of the brand, you end up quitting because of your boss or people around it. So the reality is that you need to know who you're working with. Um, some folks who ended up, and, and I would assume a lot of you all are in, still in the early phases of your career, this is probably a much bigger factor than the organizational brand or the size of the organization or the perception the market has about it, right? Um, the fourth is actually my favorite, which is compensation. Um, it's, it's one of those, uh, and, and I can narrate a personal incident, incident as well as one of my colleagues, uh, both of us joined Arawar in similar time frames. So I think compensation is an interesting topic because uh, at some level I feel uh, there are a lot of large organizations which pay well, and but I don't find too many people as excited about their work. And so for me, the excitement at work counts towards compensation. And at least when you're making some of these transitions, your own candidature becomes a lot more attractive to the organization if you're flexible about compensation. For instance, when I moved out of HSBC, I was very flexible to move back to a fresher salary when I said, I'll, I'll join Alivar. I mean, of course, uh, that got corrected very soon because I was confident that I would deliver. Uh, but I think the hangups on compensation often stop people from exploring the market freely and becomes a big roadblock in what should be a passionate career path, right? Um, if you invest in the early days, and this is not about trading off compensation and work quality, I think if you're trading off compensation, make sure you're getting something, getting into something you really enjoy and are excited about. Um, that near-term investment really pays off in the long run. Um, I found lots of people who started with the highest compensation and flattened out post that. So, so I think that's one call to be taken. I've also found um, the decision maker part is, is an interesting one. You know, people invest based on uh, a lot of influencers around them could be uh, anything from the, the hyperactive news channels we have to the local gossip on which, which investments are good options to somebody in your family, to a good friend who's seemingly experienced. I think I found similar patterns as far as career decisions are concerned. I found that very often there are important people who influence these decisions, make sure they're on board and make sure you have the freedom to make your decisions and own those decisions. Uh, it helps reduce the noise around post uh, post-purchase dissonance, as they call it, right? Um, um, moving on, I think top uh, conviction and what is the basis for your conviction is an important aspect. Um, here, I think uh, what I mean is that when you're thinking about applying for a role, you need to ask yourself as to why you know you're good at something, right? Uh, for instance, when I was moving out of uh, a, a several years in retail banking, there was no relevance to being an investor, but I did spend a fair amount of time working on the practical aspects of a retail distribution model, as well as working with the leadership teams uh, that ran those businesses. And you need to know what is it that tells you you're good at something. And it helps to have that clarity in your mind, even when you're, I mean, all of these factors are about getting clarity at your end. But believe me, if you have that clarity, the chances that you're super impressive in your conversations with potential uh, folks who are looking to recruit you are likely to go much, much better, right? Um, I think at the end of the day, 
uh, know what's an ideal career path. But if you're prepared for the worst, you've probably given yourself the maximum freedom in life. Um, I'll just take two more minutes uh, for the last part and then maybe jump into uh, move on. Um, I think there is a big part of uh, today's world which hinges on work-life balance. And I think this is not just for the women in this group who may be attending, but for everybody. Post-COVID, probably everybody has spent their time doing household chores and challenges of balancing out careers and, and life at home. I found that the best chances of, of doing well are not about, uh, I mean, and, and I'm speaking as an organization that is two thirds women, both at a leadership level as well at an overall organizational level. Um, we've had tremendously driven people at the organization. And the reason is probably not trying to strike a work-life balance. At some level that balance is, is very, very tiring in my experience because you're constantly trying to figure out some kind of a management of both sides of your world. Uh, for me, the holy grail of finding sweet spots, whether it is impact and capital markets, whether it's your life at home and your career, whether it is your passion and your remuneration, I think that sweet spot comes from a certain work-life excitement that you're able to find in your lives. You, at least for me, I can speak personally, the fact that I, I do have a five and a half year old son, I have, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't be as excited about work if I didn't feel excited about the life at home, right? And so it's important to get everybody and your close people in the family on board with what you're planning to do. And that excitement is actually something that is energizing and not tiring, even with two times the amount of pressure on you. And all of these things make a difference in how you make your choices, the clarity of decisions, and, and ultimately where life leads you as far as careers are concerned. But maybe I'll pause there and hand over to see what. Thanks, Jyotsna. Uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, that, uh, you know, wonderful insights on impact. Now, you know, we have tons of questions, of course, but, uh, you know, to begin with, there are regular funds who choose a ESG or a green investing or a PRI as a theme. And then there are impact, impact funds who start with an objective of impact, right? Do they end up merging somewhere? I mean, eventually, I, I, I mean, I, what I could gather from your slides is that, you know, impact investing is not, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, free investing. I mean, you end up making obviously returns which are much more comparable to some of those. So where is that differentiating line? I mean, you start with impact objective and then you invest, or people who are investing just choose to have a theme like an ESG or a PRI or something. I think that's a good question and, and the answer may differ based on the intentionality point I made and where people lie on that spectrum. Very often people do have a nominal return target and some have a, a maximization of return target. Um, I think the way I would say we look at it, for instance, or, or a lot of funds that are investing in the impact space look at it, is that you do want to make sure that uh, I think there is a hygiene element of whether a business is impact or not, right? So when we're looking at business models, we pretty much decide upfront as to whether the DNA is to create, uh, focus the business around that customer segment or not. If the answer is yes, then we see whether it is aligned to maximization of, of returns. But we don't go the other way. We don't look at commercially attractive models and then see if they are creating impact. I think we look for a sweet spot where both are equally important. Right. Uh, right. So for, the intentionality becomes the basis. So if, if that's clear in terms of how you define a thesis, it's like saying you have a tech fund, you have a low income communities fund, right? That's your investment thesis, effectively. Right. right. And I mean, and off late, there are a lot of these family offices and so called billionaires and millionaires who have some sort of a philanthropic angle to, uh, you know, investing. I mean, you yeah. know, you have this Wipros of the world and the Microsoft of the world and stuff, right? Sorry, that's not, sorry. Yeah. So you have the Wipros of the world and the Microsoft yeah. of the world and other stuff, right? No. Yeah. So is 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 impact or you know making a difference or you know getting the change? Is that a trend in finance which we can't ignore? Just like you know the whole active passive thing. I think it is. It is. Uh, I I think maybe as of last year I would have said it's a trend. I think today it's more than a trend. It's becoming more of a reality because every large pool of capital globally has has been talking about figuring out how to think about impact and doing more than just uh, making money on capital. 
So it it may come. I mean, it's it's interesting. You look at some of the largest private equity shops in the world, and and you look at their websites of late, and you will see that difference. Uh, it is in the active language of high net worth individuals, as you said. It is in the active language of of how. I mean, today even endowments and everybody has an allocation, not just today, but that's of course been a long-standing trend. But I I do see a lot of these trends shifting. And if you look at some of the large pools of capitals like pension funds and global endowments, et cetera, even a small decimal shift in these allocations could flood markets like ours with capital, right? So I think it's a lot more than a trend today. So to you know to be more precise, is that a skill set or is that something which candidates can't ignore on their resume when applying for jobs, saying either they have interned with some impact fund or either they have read with something or either they have researched or something. I mean, is that a skill set which which is now prevalent? I mean, just like everybody wants to have yeah. Excel modeling and you know so and so forth yeah. or a Java yeah. or whatever Python these days, is that something which is worth having on your CV? I think having a clear understanding of the space is worth having on the CV and how you demonstrate that can come in different forms. Now, even if you haven't interned in a space like this, so long as you're able to be authentic about why you believe in it, I think that is something that is needed because it's almost like saying you cannot be a tech investor if you can't, don't understand technology, right? So you cannot be in the impact space if you don't understand these things. So how you gain an understanding, uh, I think I would say it's a combination of methods. I mean, the good part is we're all in emerging markets in India here, and you just have to look around you. You need to have 20 conversations with people impacted by COVID or people who've lost jobs, and you start forming a much deeper holistic perspective of the world. And I think that is required when you walk into these conversations or apply for any of these roles. Sure, sure. Uh, from a career perspective, you did mention that people come from various aspects of, you know, roles from finance, from banking, from operations to impact, as long as they're clear on, you know, what they want to do. Uh, but where does the career lead to post impact? I mean, do people move out of impact to like a regular, you know, uh, investing or is, is that like a specialization which people do? Well, uh, whether you think of, the Hindu, think of the Hindu philosophy or heaven, <laughs> I think where do you go from there is the question. To me, this is where, uh, where this is the ideal. I mean, if you ask me, in, historically, you know, a lot of uh, people spent their years, lives in regular years. careers and then tried to spend some time towards social service, towards the fag end of their lives. If you get to do that early on why, and, and in the process build an exciting career which has uh, leverages commercial skill sets, etc. I I don't see why one would want to go anywhere from there. Like I I'm I've seen a lot of people in impact who've uh, pretty much stayed in impact. Very few reverse journeys, if you ask me. Yeah, I mean, as long as it impacts you and it impacts the investors or Absolutely. investees which you're doing, I'm sure you will continue. Yeah. Uh, but you know, my perspective was, you know. Your people obviously get different geographies experience and I'm sure some people get impact experience. Within impact itself, do you end up having sector specialization like only MFI or only, you know, agri or only that and then, you know, you end up moving within structures? How does the whole, you know, uh, the job role per se? So, I mean, traditionally you might have an associate analyst, you know, partner, operating partner. Yeah. How does that happen in impact? Is it more generalized, specialized? I think some funds do have a more specialized approach and, and uh, at our end, of course, our specialization is more the customer segment. Uh, to that extent, we're not fussed about sectoral understanding, but more people who understand how decisions are made on the ground. But uh, if you think about non, um, you know, funds which are looking at themes like clean energy and things like that, I think it helps to have context of that. And very often I've actually encouraged people to make sure that they have some commercial experience before they move to impact so that they have a concrete value proposition on how they will add to the to the role that they're looking to join, especially if you're joining at mid-career levels, et cetera. So, I mean, a lot of the people, uh, I think we, we often say it's easier to socialize a commercial career than to commercialize a social career. So at some level, it's great if you worked in commercial spaces and understand some of these sectors. And so long as you're able to connect the dots on how it links to impact, that's good enough. You don't need to have worked with an MFI or something to say you will add value to that sector. Right? I'm, I'm a great example in that. I've never, I didn't even know the word impact investing before I joined. And I think that's not a bias that we hold necessarily. We're just looking for great talent ultimately. And that's true for everybody in impact. 
See, the other paradox is every startup I see seems to suggest that they are making a difference on the ground, on the, the way India works. I mean, whether it's the Paytm or the Google or the Farm Fresh or whatever, you know, a, any startup. I, I mean, I haven't seen a startup which doesn't say that he's not solving a problem on this earth. So <laughs> where do you differentiate? I mean, yeah, so I think everybody will have a view on that. But I think, like I said, uh, to me, the, the focus on the underserved customer and whether the business is centered around that is the main driver. Um, I think ultimately there are a lot of platforms that exist which have double dual customers, right? You have potentially if you have a platform that is uh, selling goods from SMEs to, to a certain audience. The question is, is, is the business's primary objective to solve for the small seller or is it solving for the buyer? Um, if it is solving for the buyer, to me, that's not at some point this will break because then decisions will be made in a manner where it ends up squeezing the other side and then the mid, the impact dimension gets impacted. So you need to see how the solving for the customer you wish to impact is the core DNA of the organization. And of course you have to make sure that that principle drives returns and, and makes the organization a great organization commercially as well. Sure. So sure. it's a softer test and a softer screen probably. Sure. So, and, and just like, you know, typically, you know, uh, cell side is more centered around Bombay. I mean, uh, and then you have other IT centers across. I mean, are there, uh, within India, are there cities where impact is kind of more prevalent and maybe more centered? I mean, I'm sure everywhere it's impact, but you know, do you have like a cluster of impact funds out there in maybe Bangalore or Hyderabad or anywhere? Um, I think the reality and probably Fortunate reality is most of the talent is still centered around uh, metros and so most of the organizations that are driving these things tend to be centered around metros uh, and depending on the type of firm you're looking at uh, you will find them across Chennai, Bangalore, I mean the usual suspects, Bombay, Delhi, etc. Uh, but I will say in the post-COVID world I, I don't know how many folks are open to remote working and, and although there's nothing like working out of the same location it's still centered around the metros is, is all I would say. Sure, sure. And uh, you did mention somewhere saying that the bar for getting into an investment vehicle is uh, so high. So the question I have from one of the audience is, why is the bar so high? It's a simple answer. Um, it is high because you're trying to be a very good partner to some of hopefully the world's leaders in the world, right? I mean, you're talking about CEOs who will go on to build billion dollar plus businesses serving like billions or millions of people at least. And if those leaders need to have a trusted partner and a sounding board, it requires you to have a combination of life, life experience, um, right. humility, uh, the ability to learn, have context of the business, have context of the end customer, know how this all fits into capital dynamics, which may not be what the CEO or the founder is as well versed with and to be able to pull that all. So I would say it's a regular private equity slash VC skill set plus, 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 plus that is needed. And, and, right. and everyone knows how many, what the potential, I mean, that itself is a high bar. And so it is a high bar, but um, I, I would repeat, it is not the stereotypical profiles that we see. So we don't necessarily need some people coming out of big four consulting firms uh, we don't, we need people who can combine the humility and operational ground understanding with the maturity to deal with uh, senior entrepreneurs. Sure, sure. And in terms of, you know, uh, you know, candidates actually looking to sort of get into impact, I mean, we get a lot of people who want to change or switch from non-finance roles to finance, uh, you know, essentially, uh, uh, you know, maybe from IT, from operations or from some other uh, role to within finance, what kind of strategy should they, uh, you know, uh, look at? I think fundamentally you have to build a skill set which plays to your strengths. So let's say your your skill is is to be an absolutely amazing researcher, right? And, and you're not the best when it comes to Excel modeling or negotiating legal contracts or whatever. I think leverage your skills and make the case that you can talk about things that somebody ordinarily will not be able to talk about because you've invested your time and effort and, and demonstrated that you have a unique skill set, which is valuable to an organization. 
Now, just discovering these organizations is a core part of the strategy because they're not as well known unless you really get into the space, right? Today, in fact, there's a recent trend of some of the recruitment agencies focusing on impact recruitment. So there is an organization called Sattva, for instance, a lot of the regular recruitment firms also have impact recruitment practices, both at a senior level and at mid levels. So there are firms that have started going down this path. But I think the first step is to to research and understand this place. It's there is a lot of content available online. And if you just use LinkedIn well enough, you'll run into people you know who are already in the space. Uh, our own analysts at Elevar are the best sources of future pools of analysts. So very often we, we are flooded with applications that come in through inbound referrals, right? So wow. I think that was probably the best way to go about it. Sure. So impact, getting a career in impact is not like sacrificing your life and you know working for something where you don't make money. You do end up making money. <laughs> I, I think we should all be ambitious for ourselves, for the world, for the end customer. And there is a sweet spot where all these things are possible. But I will repeat, I think this is not about saying that uh, I have a single-minded focus on compensation. I think the question is, do you see careers and compensations as beyond your monthly paycheck? And are you willing to take a longer term bet on yourself as well as your compensation? Because I think ultimately for me, a fulfilling career is, is also a function of the lifestyle you need and the aspirations you have and how happy you are on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Uh, so to me, that's the holy grail ultimately. Sure. And uh, you did mention that you left HSBC and then joined Elevare, you know, at a lower salary because you wanted to do something. So. What is it or when is it that you find your calling? I mean, is it only after you sell your Ferrari or? <laughs> <laughs> I had no Ferrari to sell for sure. So um, I think, uh, I think and, and this is an interesting, most people have a certain moment when they're like, what am I doing in life? I want to do something more meaningful. Um, and I had one such moment for sure. In fact, when I was joining HSBC, I said I'll work in this, uh, in, in a corporate career for a few years and then transition to the development world and as such. Uh, and then got lost because it was interesting all said and done. But I think one of those days I realized that, you know, uh, all said and done, I wasn't really working with the customer segment that inspired me the most. And so when I spoke to my husband, he was like, why don't you just forget about compensation, forget about anything? Because I think if you put too many constraints on yourself, then the chances of finding an ideal role up front is tough. So when I was looking to join Elevar, I said, okay, compensation, no bar, title, no bar. In fact, a lot of people told me microfinance is in deep crisis, not yet out of the woods. Are you crazy to be making this move? But I looked around and I said, there are, we're, we're a massive population. And if you just see this massive purchasing power, I said, there's no way this space is going to die out because there's so much demand. And so for me, it was a more fundamental call. And it was a, a commercial call as well to say that I'm going to go make this move. And, and bet on my own strengths and see what I make of it because it wasn't important for me to get a 10% hike on my last salary. I was willing to take that call sure. and make a move. Yeah. Sure. Two last questions quickly. Uh, so one is, uh, is there any standard profile which you look like, you know, have a CA or an MBA or something? Is, is it like a prerequisite? I'm sure more the better in, in people in India. I mean, Indian population is mostly, you know, overqualified qualified to most of the jobs. But is there a checklist, you know, with like a minimum, minimum standard? Uh, are you asking for an investing role or in general an impact role? I, yeah, an investing role in, in this context of the webinar. In this context. Uh, I will say there are enough non-MBAs on our team, uh, including at the partnership level. So that should give you one aspect of the answer. I think we look for raw skills, which are high IQ, high EQ. Um, and, uh, and a drive and an ambition. You do need to be sharp. I think that's, there's no doubt about that. So to some extent, if your qualifications are proxy for that, it, it's fine, but we're, we're never screening out candidates because they don't have a certain qualification. But we do look for some proxies for excellence and, and demonstrate a track record. Sure, sure. Now the last question, which is a million dollar impact question, if you can to do that impact, how does one apply for a job at Delaware? <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I already mentioned to to Ajit who leads all things people at our end of a senior professor saying that you may be flooded at the end of this but I think honestly I mean to be honest we have all of one position probably right now 
and and in conversations but i think there are a ton of opportunities across our portfolio which are fascinating and i've actually had multiple people who came through to chat with us for interviews who today work with our portfolio companies are and are extremely excited so i will say apart from looking at uh, funds look at the portfolios of funds because it's it's an exhilarating ride right ultimately these are fascinating spaces building something meaningful sure sure well thank you so much uh, josna for uh, your insights on impact investing for our audience the presentation link is already available in the chat function you can download it and uh, please do provide your feedback it helps us uh, you know uh, making sure that we deliver on uh, cpd uh, you know in the right fashion to you uh, for cfa society and institute members you can claim your professional learning credit by logging on to the online uh, peer tracking tool and don't forget to register for our upcoming webinar on 24th of august not 24th of august i'm maybe this wrong the future of real estate investment uh, on 24th of september uh, thank you for participating in today's webinar and have a good evening copyright 2020 all rights reserved this program is designed to give accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered It is distributed with the understanding that CFA Institute is not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, tax, investment, or other expert advice. If legal advice or other expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional should be sought.